Okay. Hi, so good evening, everyone. My name is Niraj. Um, I am a foundation year one doctor here in London, um, and I'm going to take you through some cardiology SBAs for your finals uh, for QuesMed. Hopefully you find this lecture useful. Feel free to ask any questions you want to in the chat or in the Q&A, and I'll try my best to get to them. Um, so today we hope to cover some core cardiology topics, so things that are really high yield that come up frequently in exams and in clinical practice, uh, and hopefully will stand you in good stead for your finals and beyond. So here are some of the topics that we're going to cover. So everything from ACS uh, to valvular lesions, uh, common emergencies, tachycardia, bradycardia, and other common conditions like atrial fibrillation. So uh, without a delay, let's just start off with this question. What I'll do is give you, um, oh, there we are, we've got a poll. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a read and then answer, and then we can talk through uh, what the correct one is. All right, fantastic. So we've got lots of responses there. Uh, I'm not sure whether you guys can see the answers or not, uh, but the majority of you have gone for B, so that's unstable angina, followed by an NSTEMI, um, and then the rest of the options are kind of scattered amongst them. No one voted for E. What's the correct answer? Well, it's B. Um, so well done, guys. And the reason for this is because acute coronary syndrome is sort of a spectrum of different conditions. Uh, and the way you diagnose it is based on ECG findings, but also on patient symptoms and on the findings of biomarkers like the troponin. So in this case, oh, uh, in this case, we've got unstable angina because although we've got T wave inversion, so we've got ischemic type changes uh, on the ECG, the troponin measurements, which are sequential, so repeated troponins are normal. Um, if they were abnormal and they were raised, then we would say this is an NSTEMI because there's evidence of myocardial damage. But as it stands, this is unstable angina. Uh, now, sort of to be aware of, the distinction between unstable angina and an NSTEMI is a bit academic. Generally speaking, we'll talk about management, but generally speaking, management is similar for both. Uh, but we can come back to that later. Um, it's not A because there's no ST elevation. We've got T wave inversions. Uh, and it's not D because this is not a stable uh, patient with ECG changes. And it's not E because myocarditis uh, is, is a different disease process. It uh, presents in a different way. So well done on that one. So moving on to question number two. So we've got a patient uh, who's recovering from an MI with a complication. Which complication do we think it is? OK, so let's take a look at some of the answers. So here we've got a more interesting split. So you're almost uh, evenly split between A and B, so papillary muscle uh, issues and the left ventricular free wall, uh, followed by C, D and then E. Now, the complications of MIs, uh, although you don't usually see them that commonly in clinical practice, are definite exam fodder. So they do come up quite a lot in SBAs. The answer in this case is C, the interventricular septum. So what we've got here is a ventricular septal defect causing the symptoms that the patient is experiencing. Now, A, which is the pleural space, um, would sort of signify pneumothorax or hemothorax, which uh, isn't likely with an MI. B is a left ventricular free wall rupture. Uh, and I think the explanation sort of just moved down a bit, but 
a rupture would present with heart failure signs plus signs of cardiac tamponade, uh, so hypotension, um, sort of muffled heart sounds, etc. And the reason for that is because blood is pouring from the left ventricular free wall, uh, the left ventricular wall into the pericardium. Uh, C is the correct answer, which is a uh, ventricular septal defect, and that uh, presents like this with a harsh pansystolic murmur, as you would get in a VSD otherwise, and a raised JVP, so signs of heart failure. D is the pericardium. This is usually a Dresler syndrome uh, or a post-ACS pericarditis, and it would present like a pericarditis a bit later on after the, um, after the event. And E, the cardiac conduction system, you would usually get, as the slide says, um, you would get signs on an ECG, so things like heart block, sinus bradycardia, and so on and so forth. So I hope that clears that one up. And this is just an ECG for you guys to have a think about. So you can put it in the chat or in the Q&A where you think the site of the lesion is. So we've got obvious sort of ST elevation changes. Um, what have we got coming in? So we've got someone saying left anterior descending. Um, and I'm sure you've all kind of come up with an answer, but yes. Yeah. So this is this is likely a lesion of the left anterior descending artery. So we've got sort of anterior septal changes at uh, ST elevation um, in that territory. We'll come back to territories in a minute, but again, uh, going back to what ACS actually is, uh, as I've said before, it's a spectrum of disorders, the unstable angina, and stemmies, and stemmies. I'm not going to read out the sort of explanations for each of those because they are on the um, they are on the slide. But it's important to remember that aside from stemmies being ST sort of um, having ST elevation on ECGs, uh, there are other mimics of uh, stemmies or other STEMI equivalents. So an example of that is a new left bundle branch block. So if you have a patient with chest pain and a new left bundle that hasn't previously been documented, then you should treat them as a STEMI. There are a few other niche ones, but I won't really go into them today because they're not that high yield. That's the diagnosis criteria of a STEMI. So remember that usually ST elevation has to be in contiguous chest leads. So you can't just have a random ST elevation in one lead and call that a STEMI. Um, and then you've got your STEMI equivalents, like the left bundle branch block. Diagnosis of an end STEMI is slightly different, uh, but again, it requires two of the criteria that are on the screen. You can watch this uh, lecture back. It will be recorded if you want to have a look at the slides again. Uh, going back to the sites of lesions, I find this table really useful. Um, so you can have a look through it. You can characterize where the lesion is or where the blockage is based on ECG changes. The most common patterns that you'll see are up there on the screen. Of course, not every patient does fit these patterns, but for exams, you generally see these um, with their corresponding coronary arteries. So as you said quite correctly, we saw anteroceptal um, ST elevations in the previous ECG, which would correspond to the left anterior descending artery. Another thing that I find quite useful um, and that I don't think is talked about enough is this concept of reciprocal ST changes. So when you have an ST elevation myocardial infarction, you will often have ST depression in uh, other territories. And this mnemonic sort of helps you understand or remember which territories would be depressed if you've got ST elevation in another territory. Uh, so it's pales and you can have a look at it on the screen. So if you've got uh, posterior um, ST elevation MI, which is a bit difficult to, um, which is a bit difficult really to, to look at on the ECG, then you would have some anterior ST depression. If you have an anterior STEMI, you will have inferior ST depression. If you've got an inferior S, uh, ST elevation MI, then you'll have uh, lateral depression and so on and so forth. So if we go back to our Diag sorry, if we go back to our ECG over here, you can see that we've got an anteroceptal ST elevation um, MI, but we've got some reciprocal ST depressions, mainly in the inferior territories. So if you have a look at lead three, for example, and lead two, that supports the diagnosis of a STEMI if you're ever unsure. 
So managing a STEMI, this is something that does come up quite often in clinical practice, but also uh, obviously in your exams. So STEMI is a medical emergency. It means that there could be critical ischemia of the heart muscle caused by complete occlusion of one of the coronary arteries. Usually the approach to any medical emergency is A to E, but obviously these are some of the more niche points that you might want to know about in managing a STEMI. So the first one is uh, targeted oxygen therapy. So you want to aim for SATs of over 94%. There is evidence that giving oxygen uh, when you don't have hypoxia in uh, a STEMI or in any kind of MI can cause harm. So be careful with oxygen. It is a drug and should be prescribed just as any other drug. Uh, the most important thing really is to give them aspirin uh, or another antiplatelet and contact uh, your nearest catheter lab or PCI center, depending on the time of presentation. So you give them a loading dose of aspirin, 300 milligrams to chew. That also applies if they're already on aspirin. So if they're on aspirin because they've had an MI before or because they've had a stroke, you give them a dose of 300 milligrams. Uh, some hospital protocols will say give clopidogrel or ticagrelor or prasugrel. So again, take a look at where you're working and take a look at the latest NICE guidelines. Give them some sublingual GTN for symptom relief. In the chat, I would be very happy if someone could tell me uh, a, um, a contraindication to using GTN or when you might be a bit more careful with it. You should control their pain because stress on the heart because of pain obviously worsens ischemia. So morphine or diamorphine is often used. I don't forget to give an antiemetic. Usually metoclopramide tend to avoid cyclozine in patients with MIs because it increases cardiac contractility, which can worsen ischemia. And then you need to get them definitively treated. Now, if they present within 12 hours of the onset of pain and uh, you can get them to a PCI lab, that's a primary um, sort of cath lab, basically, within two hours, then you should send them for primary percutaneous coronary intervention. So they have their um, they have their vessel stented uh, if it's causing if there's an occlusion, if there's an occluding thrombus. Um, so that's that. And in the UK, ambulance services will often take patients directly to their nearest PCI center and bypass an a &E if they are in that thrombolysis window. Um, basically, all of you have got the right answer, hypotension, uh, and in particular, a right ventricular infarct or an inferior segment infarct would be a contraindication or relative contraindication to using GTN. And yes, PDE5 inhibitors, so things like sildenafil or Viagra, uh, do interact to cause profound hypotension with GTN, so you would want to be careful with that too. Management of an NSTEMI is slightly different. Uh, again, you want to give them aspirin plus or minus a second antiplatelet, uh, plus or minus GTN, depending on the clinical picture, plus or minus morphine or diamorphine for symptomatic relief. The key difference here is that you might also need to start antithrombin therapy, depending on what's going to happen to them going forward and if they're going to go for an angiogram or not. So usually fondoparinox is used. Um, you need to be careful if people have a renal impairment, they might require something else instead, like unfractionated heparin. But generally speaking, the majority of people will receive fondoparinux unless they're allergic to it or have another contraindication. Now with an NSEMI, uh, sorry, so I was just saying with an NSEMI, you basically manage it. Um, you manage it initially in the same way as a STEMI, but the difference is really in what the definitive management is. So you need to calculate uh, the person's risk of mortality within six months using the GRACE score. And that's what NICE recommends that we use. If it's above 3%, then they should be uh, sent for an angiogram within 96 hours of symptom onset. Um, if they're unstable or have any other signs of cardiac compromise, then they uh, might be sent for a PCI almost as if they were having a STEMI, if they're having a very bad end STEMI. The other thing is that along with antiplatelet therapy, these people often get anticoagulation or antithrombin therapy for a short period of time, either with low molecular weight heparin or more ordinarily with fondoparinux. Uh, a caveat to that would be renal impairment. Patients with bad renal impairment will usually receive unfractionated heparin, uh, usually as an infusion if they require antithrombin therapy as well. And then we come on to secondary prevention. So once you've sorted out the initial uh, issue of the STEMI or the NSTEMI, you ideally need to stop them having another cardiac event. Uh, in exams, in OSCEs, uh, it's always nice to start off with more conservative things. So things like smoking cessation, lipid modification, cardiac rehabilitation, weight loss, and then move on to the medical things that you can do. For example, giving them an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, that should be given to everybody with a STEMI. 
dual antiplatelet therapy, um, usually aspirin for life, uh, and then another antiplatelet for 12 months. Which antiplatelet, which antiplatelet agent you give depends on your local guidelines, but there has been a shift in the UK towards uh, using ticagrelor for 12 months. Uh, the only sort of caveat to that is if they have a very high bleeding risk, in which case you might use clopidogrel instead. Um, and if they've been PCI'd, then some guidelines may suggest that you use prasugrel. And I remember that because uh, there's a P in prasugrel and a P in PCI. Remember that you should give them driving advice as well. So if they've had an angioplasty and they shouldn't be driving for a week, um, but if they haven't had an angioplasty, i.e. they've just been medically managed, then you need to give them a month to recover and just make sure that they're not going to have another event because you haven't gone in and stented the artery. Just taking a look in the Q&A and checking that I haven't missed anything. Uh, so yes, the recording will be posted on YouTube. Uh, did the guidelines change? I thought it was PCI within 72 hours for an end STEMI with a grace of more than 3%. I think that is what I said, but that, that is still the guideline. So if someone has a high risk end STEMI, a grace of more than 3%, then they should have uh, an, angio, an angiogram plus or minus an angioplasty within uh, within seven. Oh, fine. The question is 72 versus 96 hours. I might ask Priyash to just double check on that in the background and we'll get back to you. So complications of MIs. Uh, I'm not going to talk through all of them, but obviously the most serious one is death. That usually occurs because of a ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, then you've got recurrence of your MI and then structural issues that we've talked about a bit. So left ventricular free wall rupture, papillary muscle rupture causing mitral regurgitation, and then issues with the conductive system of the heart. If you're ever stuck about thinking about the complications of an MI, you can think about all of the structures within the heart and what could go wrong if blood supply to that area would, you know, is compromised. And um, the other thing you can do is use this very handy mnemonic, which I hadn't heard of before. If uh, those, so for those of you who don't know, Prade Street is a street in London. It's where St. Mary's Hospital is. Um, but this mnemonic is quite helpful. So death, pump failure, pericarditis, rupture of the left ventricular free wall uh, or of the capillary muscles causing uh, mitral regurgitation, arrhythmias and aneurysms, emboli in the wall of the ventricles, dressless syndrome, and VSDs. So Wayne has asked in the chat, if someone has an ongoing, if they, someone has ongoing cardiac chest pain with an end STEMI, despite optical, optimal medical management, would they have a PCI regardless of the gray score? I think the answer to that is probably yes, based on sort of a clinical decision. I don't think there is necessarily a guideline that says yes or no. But I would think, in my experience, which is fairly limited, if someone had ongoing chest pain despite optimal medical management, then they would be a candidate for a PCI or at least an angiogram, depending on what their other comorbidities were. I don't think there's a yes or no answer to that. OK, so a bit of a break from me talking. Another question. And just to answer the previous question, it is, is 72 hours. Oh, thank you. We will correct the slides. Okay, so let's see what you guys think. E, 80% uh, for E, about 15% for C, uh, and then the rest are sort of scattered around. So the majority of you have the answer correct. So revascularization with a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass graft. Now, for those of you who pick C, uh, giving doing a PCI, um, if you look at the end of the question, the patient has significant three vessel stenosis. So you have to think about the practicalities of going in and stenting each of those vessels. Generally, if someone has multi-vessel disease, the best thing to do is to go in surgically and try and do a bypass and bypass those diseased areas. Um, the other time you might have to go in with surgical intervention is if someone has got 
diffuse coronary artery disease. So if you look at one of the arteries uh, and there's lots of different areas of disease rather than a single point, then it might be difficult to target that area with a stent. Uh, so you might need to go on and do a cabbage. So here's a helpful summary of when you might want to do a PCI versus doing a cabbage. The PCI is like we've talked about STEMIs, high risk end STEMIs or STEMIs not, the end STEMIs not responding to treatment, uh, some patients with angina or uh, angina and equivalents, or if they've had a stress test that shows inducible ischemia. And um, what that means is, you know, you put them on a treadmill or you give them dibutamine and you do an ECG or an echo. If you see any ischemic changes or regional wall motion abnormalities, that might indicate to you that the person is not perfusing their heart properly. And you might want to go in with an angiogram to take a look at what's happening. And then depending on what you see, you might want to put in a stent. Now, importantly for angina, PCIs or stenting, uh, doing that doesn't improve mortality, but it does improve symptoms. So it doesn't have a mortality benefit, but it definitely has a morbidity benefit. Indications for cabbage, as we've said, three vessel disease, multi-vessel disease, um, people who have over 70% stenosis of the uh, proximal LAD or circumflex arteries because they probably uh, won't be adequately revascularized with a stent alone, um, and very high left main coronary artery stenosis. Now, obviously, these are just sort of outlines. Uh, the approach for any individual patient would be dictated by their comorbidities. If you have a 90-year-old, you're not going to go in with a cabbage. But if you have a 40-year-old who's generally fit and well and for some reason has multivessel disease or significant coronary artery stenosis, then you might be more inclined to go in uh, with an open heart procedure. What's the difference between PCI and cabbage? Um, so PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, is when you go through the skin, usually into the radial artery or the femoral artery, and thread a wire up to the coronary arteries using an X-ray to guide you and contrast. So you just make like a tiny cut in one of those arteries and go through either the wrist or the groin. Uh, and then you do all of your interventions within the vessel lumen. And then a cabbage is what you see in the picture there, which is when you open the chest uh, and basically do a thoracotomy and you revascularize the heart directly. I hope that clears up the um, confusion, but there is a significant difference. One is open heart surgery and one is very minimally invasive. Okay, another question. Uh, if you could just clarify, there's a question that's come through, why exactly is PCI more suitable? I might come back to that at the end if you cl clarify the question a bit further. So here we've got a breathless patient coming to the GP, some pitting edema. Okay, let's have a look. So, um, 68% for E, 15% for A, a smattering for the rest. Uh, so the majority of you have the answer correct. So bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angle. So the diagnosis here is likely congestive cardiac failure. Um, so congestive cardiac failure uh, because of the bibasal pitting edema, the JVP being raised, etc. cetera. Uh, and with um, heart failure, you expect pleural effusions and pulmonary edema. So that's what the bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angles uh, is sort of pointing towards. So a water bottle shaped in large cardiac silhouette uh, is not usually a sign that's seen in heart failure. Cardiac Cardiothoracic ratio of more than 0 0.5 usually seen in heart failure. Upper low blood diversion is what you normally see. Um, and then a prominent central pulmonary artery, to the best of my knowledge, uh, is seen in a PE, but I would have to double check that. Next question. 
Uh, yeah, I was right. So the other sign, the Fleischner sign, is um, pulmonary hypertension because of a large pulmonary embolus. Okay, so let's have a look at your answers here. We've got somebody um, who's fatigued, short of breath, has been losing some weight. A um, bit more of a spread for answers here. So just the majority, so 43 actually, going for C. Um, the rest going for B and E mainly. And the answer here is indeed C. Could someone just tell me what the diagnosis is likely going to be? So someone said hypothyroid, someone said high output cardiac failure due to hypothyroid. Hi, uh, yep, exactly. So you've all, uh, all of the people who are messaging have got the right idea. So this is high output cardiac failure. So um, because there is a hyperdynamic circulation, uh, as happens in, in um, thyroid toxicosis or hypothyroidism, your ejection fraction is high, but um, you have the symptoms of heart failure. So there are different types of heart failure you can have. The majority of the ones that we see are HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. So heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, also known as systolic heart failure because there's a problem with the squeezing out of blood. Uh, so ischemic heart disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis. Uh, the other type is HEF-PEF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this is where you've got uh, an issue with the relaxation of the heart. So the issue isn't really with the pumping out, but it's mainly with the relaxation. If you think of it, it's almost like a stiff balloon that won't fill adequately with blood. And you see this in um, cases of uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, as you get in sarcoidosis and some infections and cardiac tamponade. Then we've got heart, high output heart failure, and we'll go through the causes in just a second. Um, you can classify heart failure by the NYHA classification, which you can have a look at. And it basically talks about, or basically classifies people based on how short of breath they are. Main tests to do are an ECG um, to look for any ischemia, but also for any evidence of things like left ventricular hypertrophy or conduction defects, a BNP, a BNP, NP is a, is a part of a hormone released by the heart when it's under stress. Echocardiogram to take a look at how the heart is moving and the ejection fraction. Use an ease because heart failure can go hand in hand with renal failure and because some of the drugs used to treat heart failure can have consequences um, on the kidneys and electrolyte balance. Um, and then the glucose or the HbA1c because that's obviously another risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And again, when you're asked about managing heart failure it's always good to start off with the conservative things then moving on to the medical things and then the more invasive ones so conservative management salt restriction and fluid restriction the reason for that is because obviously patients are very fluid overloaded and because in heart failure you have an overactivation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system um, and salt doesn't help with that medical treatment so the three drugs or the three classes of drugs uh, that traditionally were known to improve mortality were the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, and the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. So things like spironolactone or aprelinone. Um, more recently, though, there has been evidence uh, from trials like the one referenced that SGLT2 inhibitors like empagliflozin or dapagliflozin can improve mortality, and they are now recommended in heart failure. And then device therapy would be the last thing to do. So either cardiac resynchronization therapy to get the left and right ventricles working together a bit better, or ICDs if there's a risk of sudden cardiac death, and both of those things can improve mortality. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, now, a lot of those drugs are more useful for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction than they are for preserved ejection fraction. The main issue with HEF-PEF is usually pulmonary edema, and therefore the mainstay of treating that is diuretics. So 
going through some of the classic chest x-ray features of heart failure. We've got A, B, C, D, E. We can read through them on the screen. But I won't dwell on that because that's, um, I think most of you probably know that. Okay, so causes of high output heart failure can be remembered by this mnemonic APTT with a few more letters in there. So we've got anemia because obviously when you've got a lower saturation of hemoglobin or a lower concentration of hemoglobin rather, your heart is having to work harder. There's a more hyperdynamic circulation. Um, AVMs that cause an anat like anatomical shunting. Uh, Paget's disease of the bone can cause high output cardiac failure, not to be confused with um, Paget's disease of the nipple. Pregnancy, because of obvious reasons, um, thyroid toxicosis, and also thiamine deficiency. I can't actually remember the reason for that, um, but I'm sure it's interested if you look it up. And like the slide says, aside from anemia, it's not really um, common to see high output cardiac failure in real life. Um, usually these are sort of things that you see in exams. So um, acute pulmonary edema. So we've had a look at a chest x-ray of someone in heart failure. Now, heart failure can be chronic or it can be acute. Um, usually you see um, usually uh, you see people with chronic heart failure who are pottering along absolutely okay with all of their drugs suddenly come into hospital short of breath and that's called a decompensation. So they're in a compensated phase of their disease where everything's going relatively okay but something tips them over the edge. So for example, they might have another illness or infection or come into hospital for a surgery. They might have missed doses of their drugs and they can end up with the chest X-ray looking like this one over here. So managing acute heart failure or acute pulmonary edema is a common clinical scenario in just five or six months of F1. Uh, I've probably had to do this at least 10 times uh, and it comes up in exams quite a lot as well. So what you wanna do is start from the basics. First of all, sit the patient up because if you lie them down, the gravity will shift all of the fluid to the dependent areas and make them very uncomfortable. You'll usually see patients with heart failure unable to lie down. So you get your symptoms like orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea because lying down is just so uncomfortable. So give them a hand, sit them up. And if you do that in your OSCEs, um, in your exams and in clinical practice, then it shows that you know how to manage the basics. Um, of this condition well. Uh, then you want to give them oxygen and approach this in an A to E fashion. So usually if you've got that much fluid in your lungs and it's causing respiratory symptoms, uh, they'll probably need a degree of supplemental oxygen and you might need to do a blood gas just to check there's nothing else going on. Uh, and then give them loop diuretics to offload them and try and get some of that fluid out. Now, why? when might you choose a bolus versus an infusion? While you're typing the answer, so does we've got another question. Does anemia cause high output cardiac failure due to hypoperfusion? Um, so basically what happens is if you've got lower oxygen delivery to your tissues, your body tries to compromise um, by increasing cardiac output. So it increases heart rate and stroke volume. Um, and eventually it does that so much that your heart can't really keep up and you end up with a high output cardiac failure. You've just got sort of too much stress on the heart. And it's not pumping as effectively as it could be. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is that anemia itself, because it increases myocardial oxygen demand, and, but well, it increases oxygen demand by, um, by that compensatory mechanism. So your heart works harder to deliver oxygen everywhere. Uh, it also means that your heart muscle itself isn't getting that much oxygen. And that's why in patients with angina, you want to make sure they're not anemic. And also in patients with cardiac disease, when you look at their bloods, their transfusion threshold for um, a blood transfusion is usually 80 rather than 70 for patients without cardiac failure, because you want to sort of give them the best chance. Um, so why bolus versus infusion? So some people have said emergency for bolus, bolus versus a loading dose and then infusion. I'm just guessing, but would you do bolus in acute? Um, yeah, so actually there's no exact science to this. So usually people will do well with having boluses. Um, 
the issue is um the issue is that uh boluses can drop people's uh, blood pressures and if that happens then you want to give them an infusion it's a bit more gentle uh, and as you're all saying in an emergency you want to give a bonus so we will speed up a bit so question here and we'll just leave any further questions till the end in the interest of time Okay, sorry, not a lot of time to read, but we've got someone with uh, hypotension and bradycardia, and the majority of you have chosen the correct answer, which is B, transcutaneous pacing. So uh, if you've got somebody with bradycardia, you want to have a look at whether they've got any adverse features of bradycardia. If not, then you manage them slightly differently, but this patient clearly does uh, because they've got hypotension, so they're not perfusing, so their cardiac output isn't great. So you give them atropine up to six times. Um, and then if they're not having a satisfactory response, you move on to any of these other uh, measures. So transcutaneous pacing um, or one of the infusions of isoprenaline or adrenaline, uh, and then you seek expert help. So transcutaneous pacing is when you put defibrillator pads on and then the defibrillation machine, instead of giving a shock, gives a small pulse of energy, just like the uh, conduction system of the heart would, the AVN. Um, sorry, the SAN, uh, and then it, it sort of paces the rhythm like a pacemaker would. The Resource Council have a really good set of diagrams on managing these common emergencies. So in the interest of time, we're going to skip over this question. We're going to talk about managing tachycardias. So we've talked about bradycardias. Tachycardias are a bit different. Now, as usual, go back to your A2E approach. Um, the main thing is you want to know about the four life-threatening features of tachycardia. So if they've got shock syncope, myocardial ischemia, i.e. they've got chest pain, severe heart failure, so they've got you know raised JVP, crackles everywhere, you think they're in heart failure, then you want to get them out of their tachycardia immediately by giving them up to three synchronized shocks. So synchronized shocks... Uh, a synchronized shock basically means that you um, are giving them a shock at the same time as the R wave. So you're synchronizing it with the QRS complexes and trying to cardiovert them. That's different from defibrillation, which is when you give a random shock to try and get them from a shockable rhythm back into sinus rhythm. Uh, if they don't have life-threatening features, then you go down a bit of a different route. I'll let you have a read of this on the screen. Um, but you basically want to look at whether the QRS is wide or narrow and whether the rhythm is regular or irregular so you can try and find the site of uh, the issue. I'll let you kind of have a quick read over that, but like I said, the slides, the recording will be uploaded. You can have a more detailed read of it in your own time. Okay, so broad complex tachycardias. Um, Generally speaking, check if they have a pulse or not. If they don't have a pulse, then start your basic life support or advanced life support and give them uh, a defibrillation. But if they do have a pulse, then you can treat them according to this side of the algorithm. So if they have a regular QRS complex and we're thinking that it's VT, uh, then you can give them amiodarone, which is a kind of a broad spectrum antiarrhythmic. Or if they're an SVT with a bundle branch block, uh, you can treat them slightly differently. Now, this is beyond I think the scope of finals this would be a very very difficult question to get and I really wouldn't worry about it too much I would just remember that if it's a broad complex tachycardia and it's regular it's likely to be VT if they've got a pulse then you can give them am amiodarone if they don't have a pulse then you need to start life support if it's an irregular rhythm that's a bit weird seek expert help um, and I don't think you need to know about that in too much detail so another question 
right, let's take a look at the answers. So we've got a mix here. So we've got a mixture between A and C with the rest of them, with the rest of you going for B. The correct answer here is A. So unsynchronized DC cardioversion or defibrillation. So if somebody has uh, sort of an irregular tachycardia um, and they have no signs of life, then you need to treat them as if they're having a cardiac arrest because they are uh, and defibrillate them. The only time you would give a synchronized shock is if they still have a pulse. I hope that clears that up. And again, you can refer to the ALS guidelines if you're um, still unclear on that. Uh, and like magic, the uh, guidelines come up. So this person is unresponsive. They're not breathing normally. We don't think they have a pulse. So we assess the rhythm. We think they're in either VF or pulse vis VT. Uh, I think from the description, this looks more like VF, um, but it could be VT as well. It doesn't really matter which one it is, as long as you can recognize that it's a shockable rhythm. You give them a shock and you carry on with ALS. Next question. Okay, let's have a look. Majority going for B uh, and then the rest going for D, amiodarone. Um, so the diagnosis here, well, the answer is B. The diagnosis here is uh, likely torsade de pointe, which is an arrhythmia which occurs when the QT interval is prolonged progressively. Uh, and we know that the patient's on amitriptyline, but also on a macrolide. Both of those drugs can prolong the QT interval and predispose them to this rhythm. So this is called a polymorphic broad complex tachycardia because the QRS complexes um, don't all look the same. They're kind of increasing and de decreasing in amplitude. Um, Torsade de pont in French literally means twisting of the points because it kind of looks like a twisting sort of thing. So you give them magnesium uh, and try to correct the Try to correct the what, Niraj? Try to correct the what? Looks like we've lost him again. Hang on. QT interval. Progressive prolong prolongation of the QT interval uh, can lead to this arrhythmia. And if they lose their pulse, then you treat them as if they're in cardiac arrest. But if not, then you can give them magnesium. Uh, and I was just kind of brushing over the cause of long QT syndrome. Remember your electrolytes, but also your drug causes. Uh, so lots of drugs that we give can prolong QT, the QT interval. So if someone already has a baseline prolonged QT uh, or they've got a condition that predisposes them to prolong QT or they're taking a drug that could prolong the QT into the QT interval, then be careful when prescribing another drug that could also do the same thing. And that's why if you've done psychiatry placements, you'll often see patients having ECGs. It's not to look for myocardial ischemia. That's not what psychiatrists are interested in. It's to look for the QT interval. Okay, next question. And if we could get the answers. Hopefully this one is... Okay, so we've got the majority for B, fantastic. This is great. So pulses paradoxes, so a large decrease in uh, systolic blood pressure uh, during inspiration um, caused by cardiac tamponade. The other thing you might see is muffled heart sounds, so that's Beck's triad. Cardiac tamponade, oh, here we are. So raised JVP, muffled heart sounds, hypotension, Beck's triad, you get this like, globular looking heart, 
not very nice. Uh, it's a cause of cardiac arrest. So if you've done your ALS courses or um, any resuscitation courses, you talk about the H's and T's. One of the T's is tamponade. The management for this in an emergency is pericardiocentesis, so putting a needle through into the pericardium and draining off all of that fluid. And that's a post-treatment chest x-ray of the same person or a normal chest x-ray. Okay, next question. And just in the interest of time, I know I haven't given you much time. I do apologize. We can get the answers. So 73% going for C, 18% for A, and 73% of you are correct. So this is um, this is uh, caused by rheumatic fever. So the mid-diastolic murmur is characteristic of mitral stenosis. And if you think of it, because the mitral valve is so stenosed or narrow, um, there's a back pressure into the atrium, which causes issues with the electrical condu conductivity system or the electrical conduction in the atria, and therefore leads to atrial fibrillation. Mitral valve prolapse um, presents differently, um, and usually uh, you get a different murmur um, because the valve is prolapsing back into the atria. Um, AF is, as it says on the slide, AF is a common finding in mitral stenosis because of the dilatation. Um, but there are lots of other causes of AF, which we're going to talk about. Um, but remember that historically, rheumatic fever was very common, especially kind of before antibiotics. It's caused by streptococcal throat infections, but it's becoming less common. I'm just trying to change the slide. Okay. Uh, causes of AF, um, you can take a look at this slide again in your own time, but again, common causes, pulmonary emboli, pneumonias can cause it quite commonly, um, ischemic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, alcohol, anemia, thyroid disease, hypertension, sleep apnea. Okay. So we've got someone with aortic stenosis, which are the clinical signs listed would tell you that it's severe. And if you could look at the answers. Oh, a bit of a mix here. So we've got yeah, thirty-seven percent. So most for B, uh, then followed by E, and then A. Okay, so this one might be spending a tiny bit longer on. Um, so the severity of aortic stenosis is uh, usually usually defined by things you see on an echocardiogram. So the ejection fraction, the area of the valve, and the pressure gradient across the valve. The other thing that indicates how severe it is is how mu how much uh, the patient is suffering from it, or how many symptoms they have. How loud the murmur is doesn't correspond to the severity. It just corresponds to how much disruption in flow of blood there is. Um, the actual answer here is uh, B, a soft S2. And the reason uh, for that is because if you think of it, the S2 heart sound is caused by um, the, aorta, the aortic valve closing. Now, in severe disease, when the um, valve le leaflets are very thickened and narrow, um, the valve leaflets don't close forcefully and therefore you get a very soft or even an absent S2. Other answers here you usually get a wide, um, sorry, yeah, a narrow pulse pressure, um, reverse S2, like I've said, loudness isn't helpful. So aortic stenosis is a very common case that comes up in finals. I like to remember the symptoms by SAD, so syncope, angina, and dyspnea. If you have a, an older person who comes in with falls uh, in syncope, and it's something worth looking for. It can cause symptoms of heart failure as well because you have backflow of blood into the left ventricle uh, causing hypertrophy, and then obviously heart failure. 
clinical signs, you have an ejection systolic murmur, uh, usually louder on expiration, and it radiates to the carotids. Um, the most common cause is senile calcification. So just as you get older, the valve calcifying and, and tightening. In younger patients, you might think of uh, congenital causes like a bicuspid aortic valve. And then there's a difference between aortic stenosis and sclerosis. So stenosis is when you've got a narrowing. Sclerosis is when you've got a thickening of the leaflets. Um, the difference, again, is a bit academic. And usually you just do an echocardiogram if you hear a murmur. But traditionally, it's taught that if you have aortic sclerosis, the murmur will not radiate to the carotids. But if you have stenosis, then it will. And then you've got some other clinical signs there as well. Uh, so that's aortic stenosis. We can also have aortic regurgitation, which is when the valve is not competent and it lets blood go back in um, during systole. Uh, and so you get an early or just after systole. So you get an early diastolic murmur, um, acute versus chronic. Acute aortic regurgitation is always a worry because it can be caused by infective endocarditis or an ascending uh, aortic arch um, dissection. And then you can have chronic causes as well which you can read about after. Uh, we've then got mitral regurgitation. I'm not going to go through all of the valvular lesions. Hopefully you can take a look at them. Okay, question here. Okay, so if we could get some answers. Uh, a bit of a split again, 44% for C, 33% for A, 22% for E. So split three ways. The people who chose C are correct. So blood pressure of 90 over 60 is obviously a worry, but that could be for a majority, you know, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the diagnosis here is likely infected endocarditis. Uh, he could have a low blood pressure just because um, he's septic and just needs a few, you know, needs a bit of fluid. Um, obviously, if he has fluid resistant hypotension, then you might think about surgery because um, the disease is obviously causing cardiovascular compromise. But doing surgery on somebody with a blood pressure that low comes with its risk. Um, B, no one really chose. C, we'll come back to. D is a pleural effusion. Uh, that's not a cause, but that's not a reason to operate. E, complete absence of lung markings on the right side on chest x-ray. So that's a pneumothorax. And yeah, that would mean that the person needs an urgent chest strain, but it's a distracting answer. There's no reason that infective endocarditis should cause a pneumothorax. So that's just there to trick you. But the actual answer is C. And uh, the reason for that is because it indicates that there is um, possibly an abscess around the aortic root, which is where you have... Um, the part of the conductive the conduction system of the heart um so a prolonged pr interval first degree heart block is also sometimes seen in aortic stenosis uh, when you've got calcification causing disruption in the conduction system um but yeah a, an increased pr interval on an ecg that wasn't there before might lead you to think there's an abscess in the root of the aorta which means that the person is not going to respond to antibiotic therapy without having source control, i.e. an operation. Now, infective endocarditis, fairly common actually, a fairly common clinical presentation, uh, but definitely very, very common in exams. You can have a read through the causes in terms of, um, in terms of organisms for endocarditis. Now, the most common, the most common organisms will vary depending on whether the endocarditis is in a native valve i.e. one that you're born with, or a prosthetic valve, one that's implanted, and it will also vary based on country. But up to the most up-to-date information we have shows that the most common is Staph aureus, followed by Strep viridans, and then uh, the rest of them that you see on the slide there. One to look out for is Strep bovis. Uh, it comes up in exams quite frequently. If you see somebody with um, Strep bovis in their blood cultures and they've got infective endocarditis, then you think about colorectal cancer, because what might have happened is some of the gut flora have translocated 
because of damage to the intestinal walls into um, the blood and then stuck onto the valve. You should always think about risk factors for endocarditis as well. So what would cause bacteria to stick to the heart um, if they've got pre-existing valvular disease, if they've had heart surgery in the past, a prosthetic valve, uh, if they've got ventricular septal defects or atrial septal defects, or if they've got a reason that they would be introducing bugs into their blood, for example, intravenous drug use, recent, recent dental work, uh, or recent infections. So you have to think about all of those things if you're thinking about endocarditis. Another common infection that's seen along with endocarditis is discitis. So infections of the discs in the spine, uh, because again, uh, some of those happen because bugs move through the blood and then settle in particular areas. So everyone's favorite, Duke's criteria for diagnosing endocarditis. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I do want to say that you should take three blood cultures um, at least three blood cultures from separate sites at different times, uh, so more than 12 hours apart, if you can, um, to look for endocarditis or to look for organisms that could cause endocarditis. The um, caveat to that is for Coxiella, a single positive blood culture or serology test is enough. Uh, and then you want to have a look at imaging evidence for endocarditis, so echocardiograms uh, or PET-CTs. Now, the majority of echoes that are done in hospital are transthoracic echoes, so they're done through the chest wall. If you have a transthoracic echo and it doesn't show any vegetations, so areas of kind of bacteria settling on the valve, but you still have a high clinical suspicion for endocarditis, and you have to remember that a TTE, um, transthoracic echo, does miss looking at parts of the heart and is technically difficult to do, especially if someone has a larger body habitus or they can't cooperate with the sonographer or cardiac physiologist's uh, instructions to do particular movements. So in those cases, if you still think the person has endocarditis, you might need to do a TOE or transesophageal echo, where you look at the heart from inside the esophagus, kind of like an endoscopy. But that's only done at specialized centers. Then you've got minor Duke's criteria, so predispositions, like I've said, uh, fevers, vascular phenomena, so arterial emboli or infarcts, aneurysms, mycotic aneurysms are basically infective aneurysms, hemorrhages because of aneurysms in the conjunctiva or intracranially, Janeway lesions, immunological phenomena, glomerular nephritis, Osler's nodes, Roth spots in the eyes and the retinas, and then um, other microbiological evidence. Um, immunological phenomena are actually quite interesting. I would say in an exam, if you have a case of endocarditis or in an SBA and you've got the, you know, as part of the as part of the answer or as part of your presentation, you have the opportunity to talk about urine dip. Uh, I would say that's quite important to look for evidence of glomerular nephritis, especially if you've got strep infection. And to say that someone has definite infective endocarditis, they should have uh, either two major criteria. So like uh, an echocardiogram showing the vegetation plus positive blood cultures, or um, they should have one major and three minor criteria or all five minor criteria. There are also kind of criteria for probable or unlikely endocarditis, which you can look at. And we've talked about one of the complications of IE. Uh, so that's, um, sort of issues with the conductive conducting system of the heart but there are other complications too so valvular insufficiency or heart failure um neurologic complications strokes because parts of the vegetations can break off and cause clots abscesses again you know parts of the vegetations can break off from the heart and then move into places and cause abscesses hemorrhages from mycotic aneurysms uh, infections glomerulonephritis and aortic root abscesses the treatment of endocarditis is very difficult, uh, very specialist, and an area that I don't really want to cover in too much depth. Uh, you should follow your local guidelines. If you don't have the app MicroGuide, I highly recommend you download it because it gives you an idea of how common infections are treated. But the treatment of endocarditis depends on the organisms that are grown. Uh, the BNF basically says if you're blindly treating somebody with endocarditis, 
uh, give them amoxicillin and maybe a few other antibiotics depending on the clinical presentation, whether this is a na native valve or a prosthetic valve. Um, usually people will have to have prolonged courses of IV antibiotics because you need to really get rid of all of the bugs. They kind of coalesce together and form a film, a biofilm, sort of like when you have plaque on teeth and you need to get the antibiotics into that film. And generally, very generally, like I've said, it depends on the patient's presentation, if they have allergies, local resistance patterns. If they have a staphylococcal endo endocarditis, uh, usually you'll have flucloxacillin. And if they have a streptococcus, you'll usually have benzyl penicillin. If they are allergic to penicillins, you might have things like tycoplanin or vancomycin. Um, but it's quite common, in addition to a penicillin, to have an adjunctive antibiotic, so something like rifampicin or gentamicin. And the reason for that is because those antibiotics are very good in low doses at penetrating biofilms and acting synergistically with the other antibiotic and helping to clear the infection from inside. So um, just have those in your back pocket as well. But like I said, a very specialist area will be guided by the cardiology and infectious diseases teams, but these are some broad principles. So that's the end. I do apologize that we've gone through things very quickly, but I've tried to give you a good overview of the most common conditions in cardiology, both in your exams and in clinical practice. Hopefully you found the questions useful and the feedback on the answers useful as well. Um, I've answered a few of the questions throughout, but I'm happy to take any more and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, we will post the recording of this to YouTube shortly. Um, hopefully within the next couple of days. So if you did have to leave or if you want to revisit anything, uh, then you can have a look. So um, questions I'll start from the beginning. When do you use vasopressors versus inotropes? So this is a question in itself, I, a big question in itself. I'd recommend looking at um, life in the fast lane, but vasopressors are drugs which cause an increase in vascular tone, things like noradrenaline, and you usually use them when you think peripheral vascular resistance is a problem. So in septic shock, for example, when people have big vasodilation, you might want to use something like noradrenaline to squeeze the veins and increase uh, and the arteries and cause an increase in systemic vascular resistance. Inotropes you use uh, to increase cardiac contractility when there's an issue with the movement of the heart. So for example, in cardiogenic shock, you might want to use something like dopamine or dibutamine uh, to increase myocardial contractility and increase cardiac output in that way. But this is a specialist area that uh, I don't do as an F1 uh, and hopefully won't come up in your finals, but you never know. Um, 